for this wonderful talk, I, I've kind of been calling it like teen OPSEC or something like that. It's kind of interesting to me. I think this might actually be also the first um, father-daughter uh, presentation that we've had. Um, and so, uh, yes. Yes, so again, welcome to uh, Russell and Samantha Mosley. Thank you, thank you. All right, we're going to jump right in. Samantha? Uh, yeah, hello. So my name is Samantha. I'm on Twitter at Prodigy. So right now I'm a junior in high school. Um, I do a lot of activism in my school community, and right now I'm an instructor for Girls Who Code. <laughs> Hi, my name is Russell. I uh, smoke them on Twitter. So I'm a CISO at a federal contractor in Maryland. Uh, I have about 20 years of experience, actual hands-on experience in IT ops and sec ops. I'm not a business CISO guy. Um, but I know you want to hear Samantha talk, so we're going to jump right in. Uh, <laughs> we're also both organizers with B-Sides Charm uh, and the Blue Team Village at DEF CON. We are not experts on obfuscation, so we read a few papers and books about the subject after this talk was accepted. Uh, we're going to have a few references in our last slide. We just wanted to make sure we had most of the, te most of the termination correct. Uh, so this talk really came about because last summer, Samantha was talking with a friend of mine at a conference about how her and her friends share access to all of their Instagram accounts. And he was kind of like angry about it and amazed and blown away all at the same time and was like, you guys should really do a talk about that. So uh, that, that was the inspiration. Um, he thought that uh, the OSIN folks and general InfoSec community would find it an interesting example of obfuscation. So I'm going to give a little bit of background on obfuscation and then Samantha's going to explain the process and I'll wrap up with some conclusions. We're probably going to use the whole 20 minutes, so please hold your questions till the end if there's any time. All right. For a little background, these are some of the things that we think we teach our kids about cyber hygiene and social media. Things like installing updates and patching your devices, taping over the webcam when you're not using it right, um, using strong passwords, and uh, stranger danger stuff, like setting the privacy settings as restrictive as you can, limiting your posts to friends only, um, being cautious about uh, like friend requests, not accepting them unless you've met the person first in real life. Um, we also try to teach them that what goes on the internet stays on the internet. So think before you post. And this is getting more important all the time. So nowadays jobs are actually um, asking you to disclose your social media accounts for them to review them before they hire you for a position. And we were talking last week and apparently colleges are doing this now too where they're kind of like, they're searching social media for students and seeing if they're posting anything that, you know, is inappropriate or they don't want to reflect the school. So, you know, it's getting more important to be careful about what you post on social media. What have our kids learned from us? Samantha? <laughs> um, so, as always, kids are seeing things a little bit differently. You know, we've been raised with the technology more around us. Um, a lot of people were telling us you should link your Instagram to your Facebook, to your Twitter, to your Snapchat. Um, but if you do that, then everyone knows who you are on every single platform and you can't have multiple identities. So we've kind of stepped away from that and also we're trying not to be obsessive over our followers and over what we're posting. So not posting all the time everywhere you are, making sure that um, when you do post it is good pictures and things like that. So when it comes to social media, as parents, we're also very concerned about our kids' privacy. Um, unfortunately, these basics aren't really enough when it comes to online privacy today because of metadata. Uh, there's, really, there's more metadata out there than most people realize. Does anyone know how many fields of metadata there are for every tweet that's publicly available through the API? Anyone approximately know? Too many. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone want to venture a guess? It's more. Anyone else? No. <laughs> I've, I've read three different numbers researching this. It's between 140 and 150 fields of metadata for every tweet. So it's a lot, right? It's a lot. Um, and some examples of how metadata are, are generated and compiled here on the slide through chat, text, and keystroke analysis and language analysis of the things that you're writing. That's uh, stylometry. Also, object recognition and sentiment analysis of faces and objects and images. So nowadays, analysis is being done on your photos of like, are you happy? Are you sad? Are you excited? Um, if you haven't looked, if you have an iPhone, you can go into your pictures and there's a search box. And you can type in like car or ball and it will search through your photos. 
and it will find where it thinks there is one of those objects in your photos. And it's pretty good. It's interesting if you haven't looked there. So that's analysis that's being done on the images. Um, also, everyone knows that your GPS coordinates are tracked in a lot of apps. Um, in addition, reverse geocoding can identify your location from the images and photos in the background. Even the apps installed on your phone can create a signature that uniquely identifies you. Um, one more thing, there was a 2018 study uh, that a team demonstrated that a learning algorithm can identify you as an individual in a group of 10,000 with almost 97% accuracy just by your Twitter metadata. And that'll be linked on our reference slide at the end. So what if you want to make it a little more difficult to be identified by all that data and metadata? There's a book titled Deobfuscation, A User's Guide for Privacy and Protest. And in it, they describe obfuscation as the addition of ambiguous, confusing, or misleading information to interfere with surveillance. Some of the tools you can use to obfuscate your identity include ad blocking and geospoofing apps, although these erode functionality, so people tend really to give them up. Um, also, photo obfuscation can work, but it requires things like a haircut, a mask, or other major changes. So with that background, Samantha is going to tell you about how her friends are hacking their metadata on social media. Um, so we're just going to go back to how it all started. So from fifth through eighth grade, I was part of a first Lego League team, um, and we competed here, and um, it was called the Alligator Thingies, and we had social media for our group. So this was our first experience with a group account where there were multiple owners, and we found that if I used it, it looked a little bit different, the feed, than if someone else had used it. And so we tested this and we sent it out of the state to some different cousins and we watched how um, our, like, what it wanted us to look at changed. So um, we're gonna really focus on Instagram today um, and not Twitter because I know more about Instagram. Um, so here are just some quick security tips from the Instagram website. Um, specifically not to share your password. And um, our talk really encompasses um, the, what this tweet is all about. Um, so, yeah, they were talking about not sharing your password with anyone. So, what if you do share your password? When you're out of the when when you're out of town, you give your keys to someone else so they can maintain your house. What if you're not online? You give your keys to someone else so they can maintain your account. So. Before we really dive in, we're just going to talk about different types of Instagram because it was made known that these aren't really terms um, in the adult world. So th these are what we're using. <laughs> so first we have the Rinsta. People categorize this as your real Instagram. So this is pictures that you want your employer to see, your grandma, your family. Um, these will be like homecoming, prom, your dog, baking, different things like that. Nice pretty pictures. And then you have the Finsta, which is more like the party side of you. Um, not as many pretty pictures. And you really restrict who's following this account so that maybe your grandma cannot find this online. And <laughs> when people Google you, they'll find your Rinsta and not your Finsta. Um, and there are many other different types. Like you'll have your group account, which will be owned by many different people. So their name will be attached to the account. You'll have a main, which is like if someone Googles me, either my Rinsta will come up or my main will come up. Well, maybe not mine, but you know. And um, there'll be one owner of that account, and all of the posts are about them and their life. And then you'll have your private versus your public account. So a private account, you select who can follow you, so you have very good control over your audience. And then a public account is just open to anyone. So when they're looking on the Explore page, it, they can see your public account, and all of those pictures are open to anyone on the internet. So we broke what we were doing down into two very simple steps. So first, we have multiple accounts per user. So let's say there's me, um, and you can, in all of our diagrams, we maintain that the pink circle, that means it's owned by me. So my name is associated to the account, my email is on there. So I might have like four or five accounts, some for friends, family, work, school, advocacy, these different types of things. And then the arrow in our other diagrams, this is very important. So the arrow means that I'm the one signed into that account. So let's give me a friend. Oh, look, it's Swift. So. <laughs> 
let's say that they have four different accounts for various different audiences, and they're signed into all of theirs. So this is what we've seen is expected, um, but what if we change it up? What if we're signed into two or three of our own, and then some of everybody else's? So each account is being accessed, but maybe not by the owner. So you need a lot of trust to do this because you're giving someone else access to your account, access to your identity online. So um, you can see that I'm signed into three of theirs, they're signed into three of mine, but each account is being used. So let's give me some more friends. How about four? So you can see that everyone has their different color circles so that shows their ownership over their accounts. And let's give everybody five accounts, a Finsta, a Rinsta, a main, a public, and a private. Um, and then generally you would have people signed into every single one of their own accounts. But what we're doing, we have everyone signed into two or three of their own accounts. And then two or three of everyone else's accounts. So this gets a little more confusing because instead of having oh, I'm signed into two of Purple's accounts and they're signed into three of mine. It's mixed across the network. And then the second thing that we do is we'll have password sharing across our group because you can't access the account without the password. So I asked around to different schools and different communities how they're doing this. And um, we have some people will just have one master list and it's basically just a spreadsheet with everyone's password in it and everyone can see everyone else's password. Um, which isn't recommended. Um, <laughs> so what they'll do is they'll just send the password to someone and say, hey, access this account, we need some activity here, and then just sign right out. Um, what my friends and I do is a little bit different. So we rely on those magic like reset links when you forget your password. So this way you don't have to tell anyone else your password. You can, but you don't have to. So you just press forgot my password and then it'll email you or text you the link and then you just send that to your friend and then they can sign in. Um, and by doing this, we're able to send it far distances. So with our network that we have, we have it in my high school, in other high schools, in other counties, in other states. And right now we actually have it in other countries as well. So how are we doing this? How are we maintaining this across all these different countries, all these different places, all these different people. So we have a really big system of trust because you can see if one person goes down, there is a chance that everyone else will go down. But we use the reset links to make sure that that doesn't happen. So you can set them in preferences so that when you send a reset link, it'll sign out of everyone else's account. And so if you press that and then you send the reset link to yourself, the owner is logged out of their own account and only you have access to it. So if they mess up and they do something wrong, they post a bad picture, you can take ownership over their account. So people no longer do that because they know that we have power over their account. And we also have frequent communication because we're in high school, so we're using Snapchat, we're texting a lot, we're using Instagram, Twitter, all these different things. And so we're able to monitor each other, to be like, hey, what are you doing this weekend? You want me to post something? Oh. Have you been active on mine? Are you doing anything bad? And then we're also monitoring the progress. So we're looking at different ways that Instagram spots our metadata, and we are testing to see if it's what's on a usual account and if it's different. So as always, you have to have some rules. So we have three. You only post when you're asked. So posting is the picture with the little caption. And so you have, they'll send you the picture. So they want a picture of prom, you can't just take a picture of them at prom and post that. No, you have to wait for them to send it to you and then you post it. Um, of course, we don't send the pictures over the same platform every time because then people could track what we're doing. Um, so sometimes we'll email it, Snapchat, we'll text it. Um, we do allow anyone to like relevant posts. So when they're just going through the feed, they can like whatever seems like the audience of that account would appreciate. And then we ask that people avoid follow requests because even though there is a lot of trust, each owner should know who's following their account and each person should know what audience they're going to. Um, so the way that we test if it works is we look at the explore page. So you have your main feed and that's like people you're following, their posts and your posts. And then the explore page is people you're not following, but that Instagram thinks you should follow. 
So it looks at your metadata and it'll compile different accounts related to yours and to your activity. Um, so here's an example from an account that is not in our network. Um, so you can see that across the two different test dates, they had the same recommended filters. So those are the filters up at the top. You can click them and it'll sort it. Um, and then they also had like running in both of them and the horoscopes in both of them. So see, we have horoscopes, that's still there, and running because that's what they're interested in. And so this is an example of one of ours. So here's day one, you can see it's a lot of activism, mostly focused in this country. And then it kind of got weird. <laughs> So you have these weird shoe things and um, the Grammys and then different like fun facts and still a little bit of activism, but it's a little bit more all over the place. So what happened was the owner of the account was on it and they were liking things that were relevant to them and then someone in another country did the same thing and suddenly Instagram didn't know what to do. and. <laughs> The filters at the top, you can see they changed as well. In the, be yeah. in the beginning, there weren't animals, but apparently in other countries, they like animals more. So then animals popped up. All right, so Samantha and her friends have implemented what's known as cooperative obfuscation on Instagram without knowing it. Uh, so they're flooding each account with data and experience from various sources from each other, right? Like you'd share a Netflix account except they're actually creating data across all these accounts. Um, and they're also confusing the models because they have geographically distributed le legitimate location data because they're logging in from all these different places into the same accounts. Uh, this is similar to shuffling SIM cards that like criminals or terror groups are known to do. They'll come together for a meeting and like you put your SIM card in a bag, you meet and then you grab a different SIM card on the way out to make it harder to track who you are. And while researching this talk, I also learned that grocery store loyalty card swapping is a thing that people actually swap loyalty cards with each other for the same reason. I see someone shaking their head, they do this. So there are even companies where you can send a loyalty card to them and they'll send you back a different one. I had no idea. But these are other examples of cooperative obfuscation. So what's interesting is that this group of teens figured out the efficacy of sharing accounts and were made curious by the outcomes that they observed. Uh, they learned that shared accounts can maybe confuse the identity technology on Instagram. Uh, they're also in an optimal environment to use this technique because, um, you know, like criminals who have meetings and swap SIM cards with each other, they have regular interaction <laughs> with alternate communication <laughs> methods. <laughs> uh, this technique may or may not be part of the threat model on Instagram. We really don't know. Um, it does require trust and oversight. Um, even with cooperative obfuscation, they probably can still be identified through their metadata. Um, if somebody, you know, a human looked at everything and figured it out, but they're buying themselves time, which is really the goal of obfuscation. So what do you think? Can Instagram tell what they are doing? That's it. <laughs> do we have any time? We have no time left, but we'll be around if you'd like to talk to Samantha about this.